Thank you very much. Um, yes, so today I'll be talking about a joint work with Ludovico Lamy, who is also in the audience. And um, the, yes, the talk is about the reversibility of quantum resources. So I would like to start by explaining what reversibility means in this context. And for that, we have to look at the second law of thermodynamics. So uh, you may know the second law as the statement that if you have two states of a system, uh, and if you're not adding any more heat into the system, so if you're, it's a closed system and it's an un undergoing an adiabatic transformation, then the entropy cannot uh, decrease. Um, so that is correct, but a much stronger version of this uh, statement can be made. So um, in particular, in a, in a, X stopped working. Uh, okay, that's nice working. Um, in the uh, axiomatic framework of thermodynamics by Lieb and Ingvason, they essentially um, managed to phrase it as a as an if and only if condition. So it it, it says that this con transformation is possible if and only if the entropy does not increase uh, decrease. Sorry, and uh, this crucially, identifies the entropy as the unique function that governs the conversion of, of systems in this setting. So uh, if you're interested in whether this conversion is possible or not, the only thing you have to know is the entropy. The entropy tells you everything, and that's the whole uh, structure is, is encoded in a single function. So one fundamental feature of this setting is its reversibility. Uh, yes. If we have two states which have equal entropy, then um, we can go from A to B and from B to A, so this process is reversible. And for the purposes of this talk, the, all these concepts are actually um, equivalent. So, uh, uh, this idea of a second law is equivalent to reversibility, is equivalent to there being a unique function that governs transformations. And that's what we are looking for here. And as you might have guessed, uh, what we are trying to find is a, a way to express a similar statement for other quantum resources, in particular for quantum entanglement. So we want to see if we can phrase it in a way that gives us a unique function that governs conversion of quantum states. But okay, but when we talk about converting quantum systems, then to recover these kind of entropic properties, we have to talk about uh, many copy transformations. So uh, similarly to the talk by uh, Alex just now, we'll be talking about asymptotic rates. So we are transforming here n copies of rho into some number of copies of, of our target state omega, and we want to maximize this, this rate. Uh, this conversion is approximate, uh, but this error, error is required to go to zero in the asymptotic limit. And of course, this is done under some ac uh, the action of some restricted protocols that I will get to in a second. Uh, but what reversibility means in this context is when essentially we go from rho to omega, and then from omega to rho, the overall rate is, is, should be equal to one. And, um, okay, so, uh, in, in our entanglement theory, these restricted protocols, so the equivalent of, let's say, adiabatic protocols, in the beginning was um, defined as the local operations and classical communication, so or uh, LOCC. And the remarkable feature of this setting is that, for all pure states, we get that the rate of transformation is given exactly by the ratio of their uh, relative entropy, of the entropies of entanglement of the, of the two states. So uh, this is exactly what we were looking for. So we exactly obtained that pure state transformations are reversible. We have a single function that governs this conversion. And um, yeah, the second law of entanglement can be said to be uh, true in this case. Um, so this is precisely why this parallel between entanglement and thermodynamics was studied. Because this just shows that there is a close connection. And um, this motivates, essentially, the, the pursuit of this kind of uh, formal second law of, of entanglement. However, um, the issue is more difficult for mixed states, because for mixed states we may not have the same re um, reversibility under LOCC. Um, so this may suggest that there's an issue here with mixed states, but maybe, actually, there's a different way of thinking about it. Maybe there's an issue with LOCC. So if LOCC are not enough, these operations allow these allowed operations are not enough, then maybe we should just allow some additional restricted resources that would allow us to go beyond LOCC and formalize a rigorous uh, reversible framework. So that is precisely what led Martin Plenio to pose this question as one of the most important open questions in, in quantum information. And he asked, what is the smallest class of operations that can give us a, a reversible framework of entanglement? And uh, so now the, the, the 
as let's say in the beginning, the, the way this was understood was essentially how far do we have to go beyond LLCC? Uh, but actually it was realized soon after that maybe this is not the best way of thinking about this because there are many different ways of extending LLCC. And we, instead of just guessing what kind of extension do we, do we take, maybe we should take inspiration from these axiomatic approaches to thermodynamics and instead try to come up with an, uh, ac with an axiomatic class of operations that essentially includes all these possible extensions of LLCC. And a natural choice here is the class of non-entangling operations. So these are operations which essentially do not generate entanglement. So uh, they map all separable states to separable states. And this is supp supposed to be a weak assumption. It's supposed to be like a weak axiom that is obeyed by essentially every extension, every sensible extension of LFCC. Uh, but there is already an issue here because actually what we showed just last year is that entanglement is actually irreversible under all such operations. So even if you consider all these possible extensions, these axiomatic class of operations, entanglement actually is irreversible. So uh, the question here essentially has to be rephrased. We are not asking how much we have to go beyond LFCC. We're asking how, or one has to ask, how much do we have to add to non-entangling operations? And that's a much larger set already. But uh, the point is we cannot reversibly manipulate entang entanglement in a, let's say, a fully adiabatic manner. It, so, we, we really have to generate entanglement. And that already, maybe it seems like, it already breaks this parallel with thermodynamics. Uh, but there is potentially um, a way to save that because we're dealing with asymptotic transformations. So um, the idea that um, Fernando Brandao and Martin Planio had was to study asymptotic, uh, asymptotically non-entangling operations, or A and E. And the idea is that we, if we generate small amounts of entanglement and it's required to vanish, then this is still uh, physically the same as non-generating entanglement uh, in some sense. So what we would impose here is that, remember, remember we have a, like an n-copy protocol, so at each step of the protocol we impose that uh, we, from a separable, separable state, we can only get at most delta n entanglement, according to some fixed measure of entanglement, and then this delta has to go to zero in the limit as n goes to infinity. Uh, and indeed what uh, Fernando and Martin conjectured was that in this setting entanglement theory becomes reversible and we have a unique function that governs all transformations. This is the regularized relative, relative entropy of entanglement. And, um, and this framework would indeed answer the, the, essentially the question, at least part, part of the question uh, that Martin Pena posed, because we would know that essentially here we have these non-entangling operations and uh, we have some essentially potential for reversibility if we go beyond that. And uh, the interesting thing is that actually this choice of operations may seem a bit arbitrary, but actually we cannot change it much because what we also showed is that if we essentially try to go anywhere smaller than that. So if you, try, if you change these assumptions of these operations, even slightly, you end up with irreversibility if you try to be more restrictive. On the other hand, if you relax the operations, if you essentially relax the constraint on entanglement generation, then it's very easy to make the theory trivial because that just allows too much. So it seems like there really is like just one like a Goldilocks choice of operations that allows you to have a potential for reversibility and everything else just messes things up. Um, so this would be very, very nice, um, however, uh, this theory of reversibility relies on a result called the generalized quantum Stein's lemma. And um, this is a fundamental statement in quantum hypothesis testing that was actually introduced specifically to deal with this reversibility problem. Um, so yes, that is a very nice uh, conjecture, but as you may have heard, there is uh, yes, a gap was found in the proof of this result, and um, we don't know at this point if the generalized quantum Stein's lemma is correct or not. And without it, we don't know if this reversible framework is correct or not. And I want to stress the consequences of this, because that was not just the first framework for reversibility of entanglement, that was uh, actually the only known framework for reversibility of entanglement. So without it, we don't know if, if there's any possibility of, 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 of uh, reversibly manipulating entanglement, this, uh, essentially this, this connection between entanglement and thermodynamics is put into question, and we are essentially back to the start. We are asking again, can we even in any way reversibly manipulate entanglement? 
So essentially, the state of the art was here. We just have no idea. Maybe because if you look at this picture now, it's, it's, it looks very pessimistic. Maybe entanglement is just irreversible. That's a possibility. Um, however, we want to be more optimistic. So we set set on the adventure of restoring reversibility. But the issue now is, okay, we want to uh, re recover a reversible, a reversible framework of, of entanglement, but we know that we want to do it, okay, without the generalized quantum Stein's lemma, because that's difficult to prove. And we know that we cannot really relax the constraints on entanglement manipulation, because as I mentioned, if you try to play with these assumptions, these constraints, then you end up with either something irreversible or something trivial. So we, we know we should roughly stay within these assumptions of Brandau and Plenio. Uh, so how can we do that? Well, um, our idea is to look at the at the way we define asymptotic rates. So in the usual um, way, the rates are defined as before. We have a sequence of channels. We are transforming rho, uh, copies of rho to copies of omega, and the error goes to zero um, in the limit. Uh, now, these protocols, the allowed protocols, are typically constrained to be quantum channels. Uh, but quantum channels are not the most general form of uh, operation allowed within quantum mechanics. Because what we can do is, is have a probabilistic protocol that, for example, relies on uh, the outcome of some measurement. So we can try to define, some, in some sense, a pr probabilistic rate that uses such protocols. Now, the issue is how to do it exactly. Uh, a, a basic idea would be to just say, OK, we have some protocol that succeeds with some probability. And um, if it does succeed, we, end, we have a state which is close to our desired target state omega. And the error again goes to 0 in the limit as it goes to infinity. But there is an issue, potential issue here, because there is this success probability. And uh, what if that goes to zero? Because here it can even go to zero exponentially fast. And essentially, there is no meaningful way in which that is a practically feasible protocol to implement. Um, so how do we fix this definition to make this stay within the realm of, of allowed things in quantum information? Well, uh, one simple fix is just to okay say, OK, we impose the probability not to go to zero. We, we say, OK, this has to be bounded away from zero. And I want to stress that this is a very strong constraint because we are dealing with asymptotic protocols. So we have an unbound, we are manipulating an unbounded number of copies of rho. And even in this limit, this probability of success is bounded uh, by some non-zero constant. Um, so essentially, uh, when we go to the limit, essentially, this protocol becomes uh, very easy to um, successfully uh, implement. Um, but if this doesn't convince you that this is a reasonable definition, then uh, I would like to compare it with a different way of, tr of kind of trying to increase rates in information theory. Uh, so, it, okay, this, you, again, this basic definition of an of a asymptotic rate, and it, yeah, we define the error to go to zero in the limit. But now you can ask, well, what if it, it doesn't go to zero? What if we are happy to accept a non-zero error in exchange for an increased transformation rate? So we can study such, such trade-offs, and the ultimate rate that can be obtained through such uh, trade-offs is known as the strong converse rate. And uh, such strong converses essentially are um, very commonly used to upper bound transformation rates to understand like the ultimate limitations on, on transformations of quantum systems in different um, information theoretic settings. Uh, and it doesn't seem like that's relate, related to our probabilistic setting, because everything here is deterministic. Uh, but actually, what we show is that um, our definition of a probabilistic rate actually sits in between the basic deterministic achievable rate and the strong converse. So this shows two things. One, first, we can actually this our probabilistic rate can actually give us better bounds on things than um, than the strong converse rates. But uh, what this shows uh, in a very in a very basic way is just that this probabilistic rate is well behaved. It fits nicely within this information theoretic formalism of, of asymptotic rates. And um, I hope this kind of uh, together gives some justification for why this rate is, is, is some, not something um, unreasonable to study. Um, so yeah, so having um, convinced ourselves that this is a sensible notion of a rate, what we can do now is combine our probabilistic rates with uh, Brandau planar operations, the asymptotically non-entangling operations, and we study the uh, entanglement conversion in this setting, and what we show is that, indeed, entanglement becomes reversible. So we have, uh, again, that the um, rate every the rate of any transformation is given exactly by the ratio of the reg regularized relative entropies. And uh, we have this unique entropic measure of um, entanglement in this setting, and we have, in particular, uh, reversibility. 
Uh, so I want, I want to stress what this means, uh, because this, again, is the first known framework for entanglement reversibility. Uh, before this, because of the gaps in the previous results, we just had zero idea if entanglement can, in any way, be reversibly manipulated. Um, it also holds beyond quantum entanglement. So the, the crucial kind of uh, benefit of using this axiomatic approach of, um, of Brandau and Penyo is that it's, just, it's very general. So it applies not just to quantum entanglement, but to actually to very general quantum resources. Uh, yeah, and also what we can show, we can generalize our um, irreversibility results to show that essentially for any smaller set of operations, you just get irreversibility. So what this shows in particular is that this choice of these asymptotically non entangling operations is the smallest one, and we have a complete solution to the question of, of reversibility versus irreversibility. We know the smallest set that gives us reversibility. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's the main result. Uh, now I would like to talk about how we show it. Uh, because, okay, so we start with the converse, so the upper bound on the rates. Usually this is the easy part of the proof, because one typically uses properties, for example, like the asymptotic continuity of the relative entropy. Uh, the issue is it doesn't actually work here. Because we deal with these probabilistic transformations, then the relative entropy is not actually not suitably well behaved under such uh, transformations. And what we have to use here instead is something called the asymptotic equipartition property of the robustness of entanglement or the max relative entropy of entanglement. And we can use the properties of, of this function, which is nice, more nicely behaved, to relate it with the rel relative entropy of entanglement. Um, okay, so that's essentially how we do the converse direction. But the more interesting, perhaps, one is uh, the achievability part, because the original conjecture of Brandau and Penny here uses the generalized quantum Stein's lemma. Uh, and I think it's insightful to understand how it uses it, because, okay, so from the generalized quantum Stein's lemma, we, we get a sequence of measurements. These are two outcome measurements that are very good at distinguishing between rho and all separable states. So what we can do now is, we can construct a very simple sequence of channels. We, we do this measurement. If we get the first outcome, we prepare omega, our target state. And if we get the second outcome, we prepare a, some separable state. So what this does is, if we plug in a row to this channel, we end up approximately with omega, which is our target state. And if we plug in a separable state, we end up with some other separable state, so the channel doesn't generate uh, entanglement approximately. Uh, yeah, so that's essentially, this would solve the whole issue, but we cannot rely on the quantum Stein's lemma. So what can we do? Well, if one looks closely at the paper of um, Brandau and Plenio, you will, uh, you will see that they do a very careful analysis of this strong converse of the generalized quantum science lemma, and that part of the proof is completely correct. Uh, yes. Uh, and so, okay, so what, does, what that, that gives us is that we, this it still gives us a sequence of, of measurements. Uh, now, the issue is that these measurements are not necessarily very good at distinguishing uh, raw from separable states. So what, what we end up getting is, okay, um, these channels, this sequence of channels essentially can give us a large error. So we can no longer guarantee that the conversion from rho to omega is done, uh, like to a small error, but that's what we need here. So we have to w find a way to fix this error, to decrease the error of the transformation. And how can we do it? Well, our idea is to do it probabilistically. So in, a, in essentially a basic way to explain it is, y y y imagine that you add a parameter here, a parameter that you can uh, take smaller than one. So what this allows you to do, to do is to decrease the weight of this separable part of this, of this map. And okay, well, you end up with something that's not quite a channel. It's like a subnormalized, like a probabilistic operation. Uh, but what we show is that this mu n parameter can be chosen in such a way that if you plug in rho to this, this operation, then you end up approximately with omega, your target state. And for any separable state, you end up with a separable state. So it, it exactly does what we want. So now we have a transformation from rho to omega with a arbitrary small error, and the channel is free. So essentially, it, just to reiterate, the basic idea is to take a strong converse protocol and turn it into an achievable one through probabilistic protocols. And if you're interested more in this kind of connection between the two concepts, we go into more detail um, about that in the paper, so you can um, have a look at that. Uh, now, okay, to summarize, uh, we have introduced the first framework for entanglement uh, reversibility. Um, 
and not just entanglement, also more general quantum resources. This in particular restores this conjectured connection between quantum resources and thermodynamics in the form of a unique entropic measure that governs all transformations. So this conjecture, we know it is true in this um, setting. Uh, we, we, we show that this set of operations is, is essentially optimal. Uh, it is the smallest one because for every, anything smaller than that, you actually get irreversibility. Now, there are still many open questions here. Um, there may be other ways to obtain reversibility. For example, catalysis, like um, Alex was talking just now. There may be some ways, but catalysis seems very difficult to deal, deal with, so we have just no idea what's going on there. Uh, we don't actually understand why entanglement is so much more difficult to reversibly manipulate than other quantum resources or thermodynamics. Um, but crucially, I think the big open question here is, is, is the original form of reversibility conjectured by Brandau and Penyo uh, correct or not? And that's equivalent to the question of, is the generalized quantum Stein's lemma correct? If you would like to he hear some more insights, then you can uh, check out Ludovico's talk on Friday. Uh, but we don't have a complete answer yet. Uh, I want to stress that what we do here, it doesn't recover the originally conjectured reversibility. But I think what, what our results do is they provide strong evidence that uh, reversibility is an achievable phenomenon here. So there is a way to have reversibility. Entanglement is not some completely irreversible resource. There are ways of obtaining reversibility. And we can only hope that uh, in the future, even stronger forms of reversibility uh, can be found. So with this, I thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, even in the probabilistic uh, approach, you still cannot say the non-entangling operation are reversible. Yes, that's correct. So you, you need this entanglement generation. It's required, even probabilistically, yes. Even probabilistically. Yes. Okay. We, we show in this no-go that you cannot do it with That's just non-entanglement. previous work? Uh, we generalized the previous work to the probabilistic setting okay. here. In yeah. this work, okay. Yeah. yeah, thanks. And, oh. If it is said that it is for uh, complete framework for reversibility, of general quantum resources, mm -hmm. then uh, what is general quantum resources means? Does it apply to the non-local boxes also? Okay, uh, okay, could have explained that in more detail, but uh, there is essentially in the papers, original papers by Brandau and Penyo, they define a, a, a set of axioms um, that applies to, uh, essentially allows you to consider other quantum resources, but usually you need a, a set of states so the basic object being is always states there, so it's difficult to talk about uh, boxes, I think, in this context. But you could do, for example, like uh, I don't know, magic or non-stabilizer theory, or, or like a quantum coherence, these kind of theories, which have like a, a, a set of of states, which has like a, a resourceless set of uh, um, states. That's then you can talk about this kind of setting. But yeah, the most kind of difficult ones seem to be entanglement. That's why I focus on entanglement here. But um, yeah, you can check out the axioms of of uh, Brandau and Penyo if you're interested in that. Very nice talk. Uh, I don't have intention on any, but uh, if I understand correctly, SLOCC cannot generate entanglement from separable state. Yes. But some measure may be increased under LOCC. If I understand correctly. Uh, sorry, which measure could be increased under, like, uh, under A and E? You mean or? Yeah, uh, I mean uh, with, with post selection, some mixed state can be converted into. Oh sure. Uh, well, but we don't. We don't know about then. We, we, that's the thing. We don't really post select. If you could post, just post select on arbitrarily unlikely events, then you could really increase entanglement. But if you impose this, uh, that's why essentially, for us the the okay it doesn't seem to be working very well. This one okay the the because you still got the upper bound. So like you cannot beat the, these upper bounds uh, through the relative entropy. If you just allow arbitrary post selection, then you could beat even this asymptotic bound. But uh, you don't because essentially we we allow not really post selection, but like probabilistically, but uh, with the probability being high enough, essentially. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Krishna. Oh, 
uh, is there any result known about the uh, reversibility of PPT states using, for example, LOCC or other case of operation? Uh, so if you replace separable with PPT states here, yeah, everything, yeah. everything holds exactly the same. Uh, so essentially we have that, uh, instead of non-entangling, you would have PPT preserving operations and all of these th the results hold in the exact same way. So we have we know that you can get reversibility and we know that you cannot get reversibility with anything smaller smaller than these operations. So again, you have to, uh, so for example, a reversibility under PPT operations is ruled out. You have to use asymptotically PPT preserving operations. To get reversibility. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Otherwise, yeah, I mean, maybe one comment. I mean, what you have achieved is probabilistic uh, reversibility in some sense, right? I always find it difficult to think of reversibility, but you only can do it with a certain probability. <coughs> seems to contradict the notion of reversibility. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay, when you talk about, for example, about entanglement, in one direction you can go probabilistically, and then the other you can go deterministically. But in general, we don't know if you can do this uh, like that. So, uh, sorry, entanglement is distillation. So, if you go into the maximal entangled state, you can always go back deterministically. But yeah, it's 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 with some probability. Yes, uh, that seems necessary to for these methods to work. Yes. Okay, thanks again. <laughs>